Hello and welcome to the third webinar um, as part of the 2020 Waterways Conference webinar programme jointly organised by IWA and the Canal and River Trust. Uh, my name is Jenny Morris and I'm the Restoration Hub Coordinator for the Inland Waterways Association. So I'd just like to introduce Alex. So um, Alex is IWA's uh, volunteer coordinator and resident ecologist and uh, at the presentation today he'll be talking about biodiversity net gains um, on your restoration projects. So I'll hand over to Alex now. Thank you Jen. Hi everyone, welcome to uh, IWA and CRT's biodiversity net gain webinar. Uh, before we start, I'll just give you a bit of information about myself. Uh, so I'm Alex Melton, I'm the Volunteers Coordinator for Water Recovery Group and more recently since 2018 I have been giving environmental advice to uh, restoration groups um, across the country. Uh, if we could just quickly get the um, poll results out, that'd be fantastic. Okay, so there's some really positive results coming back. Majority of people have heard of biodiversity net gain, which is great. Um, and of course, it's great to see a lot of people know at least a little bit about uh, biodiversity net gain, which going forward, I might just refer to as BNG to save my voice. Uh, fantastic. Um, and do we think canal restoration is enough to protect biodiversity? Again, so a couple of mixed answers, but some more than others. So yeah, it all depends on what processes everyone has in place. That's, that's also quite nice to see. And yes, I apologize for sending out the webinar quite uh, late yesterday, um, but I do, I would recommend after this one to go through and have a, have a watch of that one. I'll send the link around afterwards, which I will go, it goes more into sort of the introduction and the um, processes behind biodiversity net gain. So uh, myself, I uh, originally came, well, finished university um, studying environmental sustainability, uh, focusing primarily on e ecology and environmental sciences. Uh, post after that, I joined the Hearts Middlesex Wildlife Trust on a traineeship program where I mostly worked on nature reserves, doing wildlife surveys, essentially building up a, a, a source of, of, uh, of knowledge. And then after that, I moved on to an organisation called Groundwork South, who are based in Denham near Uxbridge. And I worked primarily with um, disadvantaged communities to help support their nature reserve work allotments and uh, programmes to help get people back into work. So I'm going to come across. So the aims of this session are to again help understand the principles behind biodiversity net gain, to assess how biodiversity net gain will be applied to canal restorations, and to really how canal restorations can start looking and preparing for biodiversity net gain. Net gain. So just a quick question I wouldn't mind you um, popping into the chat is what does everyone think is the biggest threat to biodiversity in the UK specifically? Um, so I'll give you a couple of about, about 30 seconds just to sort of type your answers in and we'll see what, 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 you, come, what you guys come up with. So some yeah, sort of answers are coming in quite quick and fast. So we've got developers and climate change again. Yes, yeah, so developers simultaneously cause a change in land use and um, restrictions on our existing habitats, uh, as well as climate change, they can exacerbate the issue. Uh, water pollution, again, is a major issue for a lot, especially for your aquatic species and um, bankside species as well. Uh, humans is along the long, like, same lines as climate change, and they are, again, the biggest <laughs> Threat to humans. HS2, yes, HS2 is a, a, an interesting one. We're simultaneously destroying some uh, irreplaceable habitats such as ancient woodlands, some potentially reed beds, some um, aquatic environments. Um, and they, in theory, been looking at putting in biodiversity in a game, but whether that comes into practice is another question. Yeah, looking at planning, infrastructure, climate change, more developments, COVID 19, which is an interesting one. It simultaneously has done been a nice little break for, for um, the environment, um, but even enough, uh, it's also been restricting the amount of funds available to organisations to carry on uh, vital Im improvement works. Uh, yep, so what sort is climate change developed? So it's good to see a lot of people mentioning climate change, developers, infrastructure programmes and pollution. And again, a lack of public knowledge in what's good and what's not bad and what, what's not good for the environment. That's, that's fantastic. Okay, so we'll move on quick now. So we're going to look at now applying biodiversity net gains. So what is biodiversity net gain? Uh, biodiversity net gain essentially shifts developers away from existing measures put in place um, in the planning process 
and looking at offsetting habitat loss uh, and trading habitats and ecosystem services that do not relate to actual loss on site. So what this means is where we have one habitat, such as a woodland or a pond or a waterway, that actually um, developers no longer replace the habitat with something that's less good, or less good for the environment, but also different. And we'll come on to that a bit later as well. And the key point here is at minimum, developers will be, look, will be required to provide at least 10% net gain, but preferably higher. And it may change depending on which planning department you are working in. So what's different about biodiversity net gain compared to previous um, programs such as uh, section 106 um, is that actually they're looking at ways to try and sort of find a win-win-win scenario, triple wins for both um, society, the environment and business. So all these points here are taken from the head of DEFRA in their report prior to the environment bill which biodiversity net gain is, sits in. Um, and what you'll see here is actually they're putting in putting natural spaces and communities together and this is just a few extracts that i've taken from um from that from that statement so you can see while we're primarily looking at the environmental side of things it's also really keen to ensure that the um that the social side of of things and commun within communities are also looked at as well so we're going to quickly go through the good practice principles for biodiversity net gain um, <clears throat> So we'll quickly go through what each one of these means and in the previous video I did go into a bit more information on a couple of principles as well. So the first principle is to actually apply the mitigation hierarchy which is measures to avoid, minimise and offset or compensate for the loss of habitats and environments through development. Within principle two we are looking to avoid the biodiversity losses that cannot be offset by gains elsewhere. So here we're looking at habitats that are either so rare or so unique that any, if they are lost, they can, can't be regained due to a number of um, issues such as how long it takes them to establish and how certain um, natural systems are required to, to, to form them. Principle three, we're looking at being inclusive and, and equi equitable, which I always get that word wrong, um, which essentially is um, talking to all your stakeholders in the communities, um, at a national level with other organisations, NGOs and businesses, and essentially helping using them to help uh, ensure biodiversity net gain uh, actions are achieved. You also need to make sure we're looking at addressing the risk. So it's essentially um, putting in an extra, an extra number of um, factors and uh, insurances to create a project to ensure that if you can't reach um, biodiversity net gain at a certain part of your project that you can actually fall back on at 10% again. So it's about putting an extra 5% on just in case you can't, you can't achieve it. We're also looking at make, making a measurable net gain contribution. So this is about recording and surveying and being able to evidence your, um, your progress on site before, after and during. And again, we're looking at achieving the best outcomes. So that's replacing habitats that are better for wildlife or more enhanced. So that's to ensure that you're, um, your biodiversity is given the, the, the most uh, help that it can be can be provided and we're looking at also being additional so it's not just about replacing what's been lost but adding in extra so it's great if you um, replace your lost reed bed habitat with another reed bed habitat but what you want to do is to ensure it's got either more or more habitat or it's been enhanced to increase its biodiversity value we're also looking at creating a net gain um, legacy so this is leaving something for the communities, for businesses, uh, and for sort of the wider environment to really um, support itself into the future. We're looking at also optimizing sustainability. So don't just think about uh, the ecology side of things, think about how, you, how the project could um, support other environmental issues. So looking at flooding, flood alleviation, soil remediation, um, and also looking at how your project can help combat climate change where, where possible. Uh, and finally, be transparent. So biodiversity and again is a very new topic for most of us. Um, so we want to know what went well, what didn't go well, and how we can improve upon it. Um, going forward, once it's implemented, there'll be a couple of years where they'll be um, refining how it operates. So it's expected there might be some difficulties in the, uh, in the first stages of its um, of biodiversity and again. So we're gonna look at applying biodiversity net gain to a restoration. So I'm gonna take you through each one of these six um, areas, which makes up a biodiversity net gain project. 
and we'll sort of look at how we can uh, achieve, that, achieve that in restoration. So the uh, first stage of biodiversity net gain is the feasibility and scoping phase. And this is assessing if, how, if and how and where the project can achieve biodiversity net gain, where we can seek support and guidance to achieve that win-win scenario for restorations and biodiversity. So here we're looking at identifying local and national and so local and national strategic priorities. So many of you may have come across um, biodiversity action plans, uh, environment plans, um, and what you'll find is both national and regional areas that have their priorities. So in one area where we have um, some very rare heathland habitat, that will possibly show up in the priority um, in, in the local priorities. Um, and equally enough, they might have woodland planting targets as well. We also use this to explore the area of the proposed project to assess and identify areas which will be affected by the plans. So we take a look at our route and what's but what work is proposed and what habitats might be negatively affected or even positively positively affected by the project, uh, which helps us work out what kind of biodiversity net gain we can make. It's also about engaging stakeholders, looking both internally in members and your supporters, as well as externally towards funders and um, businesses uh, and, 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 uh, and communities. So the hint here is to really incorporate biodiversity net gain into your organization structure uh, about setting goals that align to your local authorities' project plans, and to sort of help try and, and look at look at what, what they want in order to help succeed in your planning applications. Secondly, and we, we assess the ecological impacts. So again, with our large scale projects, it will, will necessitate uh, several ecological assessments for the whole route or in different phases to help us understand the baseline habitats that are already present and that will be affected. So we look at the potential impacts from the works and we want to advise on how mitigation measures can, can be incorporated and what might be required. So here we're looking at thinking, we're looking about thinking ahead and consider, so consider undertaking a, a survey of the whole route and then separate, separate that into phases. So um, in some parts of your route, it may be more difficult to achieve biodiversity net gain and you can look about how you can offset that throughout your project. Compare your work so to go into the habitat survey and highlight areas that could be problematic or an opportunity, and report your findings to the um, local authority and key stakeholders. And the key takeaway point here is that actually not all habitats are equal in size, designation, and connectivity, uh, and they all play a part in the calculations of our biodiversity value, which I went into more detail in the previous video. So we're looking at habitat trading. So this is ensuring that biodiversity net gain adds to and enhances the natural environment and not transforms the range of habitat types. So there's two ways we can look at this. It's uh, for a like, like for like approach where the habitat lost should be replaced by the same habitat where possible and it should be enhanced. So that's what I'm saying. If, you've got, if you take out a reed bed, you replace it with um, reed bed and then 10%. Or in other areas where you might have a very low priority habitat, such as farmland or uh, sort of hard selling ground, it means taking a low priority habitat and converting them into a priority improved habitat. So it's taking your um, sort of put, um, low species uh, meadow and trying to enhance it in a way to increase flora diversity and diversity of other species within the area. So our key points here about um, avoiding biodiversity cannot, that cannot be offset um, elsewhere. So that's your ancient woodlands, um, your triple SIs are unavoidable, you can't, you can't really achieve triple SIs in, or you can't retrieve biodiversity in a game triple SIs, um, and also your um, very rare habitats. Uh, ensure that the gains exceed the area loss. So if you're losing one hectare of reed bed habitat, you put back 1.1 hectare of reed habitat, so you that 10%. Um, go beyond your obligations. Though you only have 10%, think about how your project can actually go beyond that. Think about going 20%, 30%, and this is only going to help you and your project and your organization to achieve um, proper, uh, some very good um, publicity opportunities, uh, both locally and nationally. Uh, and ensure the trades make sense to achieve the best outcomes for biodiversity. Uh, so you want to think about the role, think carefully about the role of the existing habitat plays in your habitat and make sure the trade delivers the same needs. So for example, if you if you take out some trees and replace it with a pond, that ecological functionality has been lost where bats and birds would have been using 
the um, the lost trees as nesting opportunities. So they don't quite doesn't quite make sense to do that, and to make sure the trade is possible. So think about whether you can actually achieve it, um, and it can be made. So again, as I said, it's not possible for all areas to achieve biodiversity net gain. Where you've got triple SIs, um, very rare habitats, um, you can't achieve, you won't be able to achieve a net gain. But you should still be following the mitigation hierarchy of planning is permission. Uh, planning permission is given to one area. So we then look at the location of your works and the habitats and the um, biodiversity features uh, within within the area. So where possible, com uh, compensation and offsetting measures should be as close as possible to your works um, and development and should be incorporated into, into the works. So these should be ideally applied on site. So that'd be along the route of the canal or in preferably 100 meters of, of the works. We also do understand that canal restoration is a very interesting position where we might not necessarily own and a lot of the land to achieve the gains. So potentially look at um, expanding your, your, your net gain opportunities to local landowners and businesses and other NGOs. And again, making sure your compensation offsetting measures um, align and contribute with priorities set out in a local authority. If you're working on a local Heathland site and Heathland is on the um, priority list locally, think about adding in those measures to enhance that area through either connecting dis dis um, disparate habitats or by enhancing the variety of species on site through plant um, from managing the plant meadows and, uh, and scrub. So when you're thinking about your features, you want to look at how uh, different like ecological features could be impacted and the location. So for example, looking at soil characteristics, if you're working on a chalk uh, grassland, um, you want to make sure that you plant species that are um, aligned within the, within using chalk or a high alkaline uh, soil. Uh, looking at how your project uh, connects different habitats, whether you can remove barriers such as hard standing fences, hard hard engineered sides that could encourage biodiversity to to move in. Think about leaving refuge. So as opposed to burning the log pile, um, burning trees and logs and, and brush, um, create refuge piles, log piles for amphibians, uh, hepatofauna, uh, birds and, and invertebrates. Think about whether your project has national or local populations of species that might not be so common in your area. So if you've got um, one of the few standing heathland habitats in Hertfordshire, that will be a priority. Um, and that will have a, a, house a number of local, local species that would only be located in that sort of island habitat. And again, think about home ranges, um, whether you, species can come from another area and start using your site as a, as a habitat, whether you've got foraging opportunities um, for a number of species, uh, and also your proximity to urban areas. So to fit in with that social um, inc inclusivity aims that the um, that the environment bills um, put in, so make sure that yeah, people have natural spaces to go and go go to and enjoy nature. It's also about education and letting people have that access, and of course your location and where it fits in the national and, and local um, priorities. So biodiversity again also looks to ensure that all sites are um, and habitats are enhanced. Uh, as much as possible. So these enhancement options can include, in, include uh, increasing the area of a habitat, uh, improving the quality of habitats through um, in, incorporating different features, such as uh, if you're working on the river, you can add an otter halt to increase the value. You can redirect some of the streams to create faster and slower flowing areas of water to improve, improve the opportunities for different species. Uh, the big one for canals and restoration is the connectivity and ecosystem functionality. So Canals are absolutely fantastic in being a blue-green corridor that connects habitats across the uh, country and regionally. So you can actually have this um, biodiverse network. And with 6,500 miles of both intact canal and derelict canal, there's plenty of opportunity to, to achieve this. And again, reducing the pressures on habitat, so removing the fences and actually even by um, going under a, a well, digging a new tunnel under a bridge, that creates a, a safer route for wildlife to to, um, to to travel across. One of the probably lesser known issues um, and, and concerns from developers from developers is the issue of time lags and time scale. So time plays a role in ensuring that biodiversity net gain objectives are met and the impact of the habitats are avoided or minimised. 
So for example, if we've got a habitat and we're temporarily removing it, so it's in, this, in this case, we're looking at the, um, the drainage of, uh, of one of the canals, the length of time you have the canal drained will reduce the biodiversity net gain value of your works. For that, for, for, uh, throughout that time, there won't be much um, opportunities for fish and vertebrates and, um, and, and wild, wild waterfowl to actually use it. We, what's been suggested is actually it's best practice to reduce the amount of time between a loss and a net gain. So early planning is essential. So if you if you know you're going to be working on one area within a couple of years, think about establishing uh, a suitable environment um, alongside the canal or further on the canal or behind the canal. So actually there is an offsetting habitat, so you, um, you won't, won't be affecting the um, biodiversity net gain value too heavily. So what we're going to do now, we're going to move through how this can be applied to uh, a canal restoration. So we're going to take you through some different steps. So the first step is we want to identify our route. I'm going to apologise to the um, Cotswold Canals and Stroud, Water, um, Stroud Navigation Authority um, for the fact I might have messed up their Stroud Water Navigation route here, so apologies. Um, so we find the route we want to take, so I'm just looking at the historic route of the canal. Uh, and other potential idea, um, other options where we can look at reducing the cost of a canal or if, where it's not possible to restore the original route, where our routes may be going. Step two is we want to identify the habitats um, within the work areas. So this work is often undertaken by an ecologist, um, but it can also be undertaken by groups at a very early stage to help them understand what might be coming in, uh, what, you, what your restoration might be coming up against in the future. So here's a very rapidly put one, um, phase one habitat survey I put together for that, for that area. Step three is you want to sort of look at whether there are any national or regional priorities within a couple of, of kilometers of your canal. So using some software such as DEFRA's Magic Maps um, and uh, looking at local wildlife trusts, I've noticed there's a few priority habitats within this area. So for example, you've got irreplaceable habitats such as ancient woodlands, We've got a triple SI, which is a chalk or calcareous grassland. Uh, traditional orchards are very much high up in the biodiversity value of, um, of our habitats and the biodiversity net and net gain metric, which I mentioned in the last video. And these come up very highly in terms of the value based on their rarity. And of course, we've got our flood meadow habitat, which runs, like, runs alongside the canal, which may be impacted by, by the works. And then think about your ta the targets that have been set nationally and regionally. How is there any targets to increase hedgerow coverage and um, connectivity, uh, increase the area of your woodland, or to enhance grass and more meadow habitats? Uh, for instance, um, it's been suggested that since 1945, 90% um, of all UK meadows have been lost due to agriculture. So whether your project can help help support the increase or enhancement of those project um, areas. Step five, we're going to look at engaging our stakeholders. So look at the local communities along the line of your canal businesses. Uh, think about how people can get involved with, with it, um, helping to restore those habitats, get involved in supporting the work of your trust or organization. Think of um, the funders, getting earlier funders and ask them whether they can support uh, your objectives and getting surveys out, getting ecologists on board to complete these surveys and do a biodiversity net gain study. You can also look at businesses about getting corporate organizations in to help restore areas um, or you can help or you can you can bring businesses towards you to actually invest into your into your canal to actually enhance how that of their developers themselves also look at your supporters to help fundraise to help do some fundraising and get people on board and non-governmental organizations such as the um the wildlife trust uh, rspb uh, and sort of in biological record centers, they can really help you identify what you've got or what's in the area. And they might be able to potentially help work with you to have to sort of take some offsets or support your works and to achieve the best uh, best outcomes for biodiversity. Uh, and then there's finally this government. So talk to your planning departments, talk to your local MP and get their support behind the projects and let them know what, what you're looking to do. Step six, we're going to look at our route and, the, and, the, and how it might be affecting the um, habitats and we wanted to apply a mitigation hierarchy. So first you want to look at avoidance measures. So these are measures where you look at trying to retain as much habitat. So again, we're picking on the um, Stroud, Stroud navigation. And you can see on the round where they're working on, um, they've actually managed to retain a number of trees on site. So whether these can be saved and worked around 
um, thinking about the timing of your nesting birds. So if you've got to remove a hedgerow, try and do it outside of nesting season, uh, same with felling trees in a woodland. We then will look at minimising the impact. So if we're working in a sensitive area, such as a floodplain meadow, um, think about how the works might be affecting the, the wildlife there. So whether uh, equipment is um, up to date and is leaking, if it's leaking, think about getting some new, new equipment, whether there's noise implications or whether the, the light, there might be too much light during the evenings to, um, that might impact uh, local bat populations. So think about how you can minimise your work schedule to, to avoid that. And then we look at compensation measures, which are, again, to, if we're affecting one habitat, we want to enhance or replace what has been lost. And if we can't do that locally on site, think about where you can offset and make those gains. So look at your priority habitats and see if you can help fund projects or send volunteers to support projects to actually um, increase, increase the area and offset your, 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 your um, program of works. Seven, uh, step seven, we're looking at the opportunities and limitations of, of, our, of our project. So think about how biodiversity net gain can either support your project in gaining new members or achieving, achieving funding or planning. So some opportunities here are where um, canals are, are a great opportunity to connect um, the disparate habitats and, and provide an, a, a safe route for ecology to track to or use as transit. Think about how your project can connect um, villages, towns, and urban areas to the wildlife and, and each other. Remove the barriers such as um, road crossings. Um, by building a tunnel underneath, you can actually um, minimize a lot of impacts and create some proper nice gains there. And if you build a rebuilding a lock structure, think about putting in fish passes or eel passes to again, remove barriers for, for migrating fish. We then look at our habitat enhancements, how can our project enhance the local habitat and how can the canal be made, be made in a way that's ecologically friendly. Um, it can be a, flood, a help with flood alleviation, meet national targets, support fundraising opportunities, gains community support and also if, if you think if you're if you're able to think about whether you can help carbon offset some of your projects, if you have a woodland that you can help plant into, keep an idea of how many trees you planted and work out the carbon offsetting that you uh, have achieved. And of course, there are also um, limitations. So uh, inevitably, by creating a new habitat or a new waterway habitat, that can give the, the potential rise to invasive species to spread at a faster rate. So your, your um, Japanese knotweeds, your um, Himalayan balsam, and your floating pennywort could have a, new, have a new route to reach um, rivers, navigations, and other canals. Uh, it could lead to um, some areas might be taking um, a pristine habitat and you could, it could potentially be de degrading them over time if, if works aren't completed properly. Um, you might come across that your route goes through an irreplaceable habitat, so that's going to take a bit more planning permission requires to ensure that you can um, in ensure that the planning, planning department are happy with any kind of works going through. And again, some, have to, some communities are very precious of what they've got. Some, no, not everyone loves the canals apparently, so potentially replacing a habitat with a canal might cause some community outrage of and, and landowners. And step eight is to present your findings and report what you have, um, have discovered throughout your surveys, um, your operations during the works and afterwards. So these are you presenting your findings, your um, reporting of ecological sur surveys, and again, letting everyone know what worked and what hasn't worked. So to very much recap, it's, uh, about all about assessing the baseline features, the potential impacts, and identifying designated sites within your area. We then look at identifying your limitations and opportunities whilst also engaging stakeholders. And then using that, then we look at setting and clarifying the mitigation hierarchy, creating a biodiversity net gain operations plan, and habitat management plans going forward. So Quick question for everyone. So I want to ask everyone what, what factors influence the biodiversity values uh, of, of UK habitats? So what kind of things do you think might affect how we value a habitat in the UK? Yeah, if you can just put your uh, answers in the chat box and I can read them out to Alex. I'll just give you a few minutes just to put your answers in there. So it's got, Stephen's put in a uh, protected species, which is a good one. Yeah, that's it. Yep. So again, we have a protected species. Um, habitats generally, um, the higher the better habitat, the better more protected species you'll have as well. Yep. Public opinion, yep. Of course. Thank you, David. So 
uh, the public opinion, so badgers, um, some people love badgers, some people will absolutely despise them. I'm on team badger, um, so that's there, so I'll say it's very correct. Uh, George has put uniqueness to the locality and the region, which is another good one. Yeah, that's, that's again put perfect. So some areas, uh, so for example, if you have a heathland in, um, in, in Derbyshire, it's more, it's less rare and probably be less of a strategic priority than say a heathland in Hertfordshire, which is very rare. Uh, another one, condition, also public awareness and commitment, uh, water framework directive, types of fish, numbers of fish. That's perfect. That's some, perfect. Yeah, some really good, really good ideas coming through. And I think what I'll do is I'll show you my, uh, the list that I put together. Thank you, Jen. So, yeah, so what we're looking at again, we had rarity. So this is the rarity of your habitat across the country and, uh, and regionally. Um, the condition, I, I believe I did see that as well. So whether your trip, for example, triple SIs have, uh, have their ratings based on, on the condition, whether your habitat is ideal, um, needs improvement or is absolutely degraded, that will also impact on that. Also the size of your habitat. For example, if you've got a bit of reed bed, um, the biodiversity action plans want to see reed beds that extend beyond 20 hectares primarily. So if you've got a big reed bed, that's going to be a lot more well protected and um, and, and sought after than your sort of smaller areas. I get looking at your location of, of the site, um, what species are present and use the site, as well as if there's any invasive species present and uh, that could potentially be a big issue. Again, we had um, protected species and the populations available. Uh, a big one is actually legislation. Um, so government governmental legislation is the primary um, indicator of what's um, high value habitat. So that again ties in um, how connected your habitat is. So a woodland connected to other woodlands is far better than just a woodland in the middle of a, of, of a arable field with very few hedgerows. Uh, the intrinsic value, so for example, looking at the Lake District, this, this, the site being able to sort of have those views um, Im it implicates uh, the habitat value. And we also have public opinion, not um, people have different preferences in habitat. So um, one of my favourite topics here is sort of the idea of shifting baseline syndrome, which going through the ages, um, what people believe was natural 40 years ago will be completely different to, to, to today, where kids have may in like so kids may have less access to those those habitats and what we might have said was um natural even so about 10 years ago has changed right so again what i want to mention here is that again not all habitats are equal so we mentioned this before like for like so this is replacing habitats that are lost with the same quality or, or higher with, with, with a net gain with net gain for biodiversity uh, and trading up so replacing lost habitat with a habitat with a high biodiversity value so here's just a couple of examples so on, on the top we have um, a cropland which has been um, all the hedgerows have been primarily moved to increase the product yield of this habitat this would be um, one of the lowest habitat values you can find um, within biodiversity and on the biodiversity metric and of course, if you have a habitat which has um, a cropland, which has more hedgerows and a few copses in between, that again increases the biodiversity value that you're working within. And even better, if you have a mosaic of habitats, where you've got areas of cropland with inter intermix of hedgerows, copses, uh, wildflower meadows, um, and they're on a crop, a crop rotation, that can increase the value of, of that habitat. Uh, and again, if we're working on an immunity ground, so um, a playground or um, or, or for playing field like this, which has very minimal biodiversity value and uses uh, one specific type of grass to, to ensure you get these lovely stripes. stripes. Um, that is nowhere near as um, structurally complex or diverse as even a grass and left to its own devices, as we can see here uh, on the right. And then as we go even further, we can potentially look at um, wildflower meadows with flowers and species diversity is even better than that. So. Just remember that each habitat is worth different values. And of course, they all um, sort of pale in comparison to our irreplaceable habitats, which are ancient woodlands, which are woodlands that have been in, in consistent use or pre existing since uh, before the 1600s, uh, and areas that have been designated as a site of scientific special interest. So now we're going to look at biodiversity and gain in restoration. 
So as part of the Environment Bill, um, government is now looking at these national nature recovery networks, which is essentially um, putting a space for nature at the heart of all our planning, um, farming and, uh, and, and systems uh, to bring nature to places where people most live their daily lives. So that was taken from the, uh, the Wildlife Trust. And essentially it's about creating a network of habitats, reserves and connections uh, up and down the country to reverse the loss of biodiversity, which uh, in the most recent report, I uh, believe it's 41% of all of our UK species are either at a threat, of, uh, now currently at a threat of um, reduction or extinction. Uh, and the aim of these networks are to create a strategic spatial planning framework so that developers, organisations and government can identify where the national objectives need to lie to increase our, our commitment to um, ecological re restoration. And also where we can target delivery of projects such as tree planting, um, hedgerow um, restoration and uh, a network of ponds and waterways. It also allows, uh, allows government to create efficiencies in funding. So um, one of the big things coming out of environment, environment, uh, the environment, environment Bill is they're looking at creating um, a biodiversity credit system where businesses and developers can put money in towards biodiversity uh, credits. The local planning department will put the money towards achieving biodiversity targets um, that they've set out, as well as looking at long-term gains and reversing the ecological uh, decline. Uh, and within the local, na uh, the national nature recovery strategies, there'll be um, they'll be putting in the local nature recovery strategies, which will make up the national level. So led by county councils in, a, in partnership with local councils and third parties, the plan here is to map local priorities and habitat values uh, within the region and produce plans to identify, enhance and restore these habitats. Uh, we're look, they're looking at a full, full implementation across the country by 2025, but it may be pushed back due to COVID-19. And they're currently going for a pilot study in a couple of different areas, such as Cornwall, Manchester, Cumbria, Northumberland, and uh, Buckinghamshire. What this means for restoration is that there's an opportunity for derelict and navigable canals to be identified within the local nat nature recovery strategy. So one, this will give the opportunity for um, canals to receive ecological enhancements to their projects and to improve habitats along the line of the canal and possibly fund the works on restoring the canal itself. And secondly, um, land adjacent to or nearby the land of canal with a uh, limited value um, could then be put forward for development in lieu of other identifiers areas. So if a developer is suggested to put, build alongside the, um, the canal, that means that they can, they'll have to put biodiversity net gain opportunities along your stretch. So when we come to managing biodiversity net gain, um, Restorations could act as a third party in managing this. So as potential landowners and land managers involved, um, two big things coming out of the Environment Bill are the Conservation Covenants. And this legislation will be making provisions for voluntary agreements in the management of different habitats post um, biodiversity net gain to ensure that the um, <coughs> that the habitats are kept up to a high, high um, test, a high value and to um to, to, to what was previously agreed in the um, planning planning um, framework, uh, as well as the implementation. So this was, a so biodiversity will be um, coming into effect during a two year transition period when the environment will receives royal assent, which is expected to be by the end of 2021 now, due to, again, due to COVID. So just a couple of case studies, um, chosen one from Network Rail, who owns 20,000 miles of track and uh, up to 52,000 hectares of, uh, of of space across the UK, and that again contains over um, <clears throat> over 2,200 triple SI sites. So the Midland Main the Midland Mainline program is a program led by Carillion, um, and it was a pilot to um, work out how net gains can be delivered on its infrastructure works. <clears throat> so the purpose of the pilot was to trial the use of a toolkit, which has now been developed into the biodiversity metric to assess the biodiversity value of the biodiversity impact of the works, um, will undertake stakeholder engagement and design mitigation to achieve a positive contribution to biodiversity. So this toolkit was created and used to help, um, find, help look at some of the larger pro programs across the country, which then moves us on to the Greater West program. So this program was looking at how um, 
the program for, of works for the modernization of the route between London and Swindon could impact biodiversity and what they could do to achieve uh, biodiversity net gain. So a delivery group was worked up and to look alongside the whole whole route of the um, canal, uh, not canal, sorry, the train track, the, the railway, and to generate long-term benefits. Uh, and as a result, they identified 25 areas across the route and this represented about 120 hectares of um, woodland restoration, 60 hectares of woodland creation, uh, incorporating a number of ponds and restoring ponds, as well as for the creation of wildflower meadows and grasslands along the lines of their, their, their railways. Uh, one more sort of look closer to home is the Stephen McGee working with the EA to create a um, to create and install a winding hole on the uh, navigation. So they did, the trust had identified that the fit number of fish, the fish numbers within the um, river and within certain sections of the river had declined over a number of years. And working with the EA, they sort of looked at plans and the design for how to create a winding hole that actually uh, benefited fish and and wildlife as well as um, uh, promote the, you know, the navigation of the, uh, the, the, um, the river. So during this process, they um, pre-planted a, a number of um, koi rolls onto the edge of where the um, winding hole will be. And over time, as this establishes, it should provide a nursery opportunity for small um, fits of young fish, so fish as a fry, uh, as well as um, increasing the, bi the biodiversity value of the um, banks of habitat and flowers and attracting bank trailing mammals. So potentially we could see the the reintroduction of water voles in this area if they're not already already there. So um, just another question I would like to ask you guys. So I want to find out what kind of um, ecological enhancements or mitigations you have put on to put into your uh, restorations. You can say while we're waiting uh, for the answers, I just spotted a question from Christine about the Carillion Toolkit. Is that available online for people to access, Alex? Oh, I'll take a look. I think it's more internal, but that was almost like the um, the precursor to the biodiversity metric that. DEFRA is now released, which is available to be looked at um, free online from the um, probably from Natural England. So I, I can send a link around to how, so where you can sort of have play around and see how it's gonna gonna work. And if it's something that people want to find out more about, it's potentially a training opportunity in the future to go through the metric and show everyone how it will fit, uh, or may well look or look like. Okay, so a few answers are coming through. Um, incorporated fish and eel pass into the new weir. Perfect, that's brilliant. Yep, so that's again removing the barriers and um, meeting strategic aims potentially nationally and regionally. Well, um, uh, the Ashby Canal have got an offline nature reserve. That's perfect. So that will again fall into the um, offsetting areas of the mitigation hierarchy. And again, yeah, it's, uh, it's yeah, perfect. Yeah, and the Manchester, Bolton, and Bury um, are incorporating an eco highway into their restoration plans. A nice We're, new idea. Which is brilliant. Again, it's looking at that um, the green blue corridor, which is almost a buzzword, which I'd recommend everyone incorporate into any future funding bids or planning um, planning documents. But essentially, this is what we'll be expecting to see a lot more of in the future once the biodiversity net gain is um, up and running, um, and once the connectivity the uh, connectivity toolkit, which is currently being developed by Defra, is is released into the public. And uh, Chris from uh, Sleaford is talking about the winding uh, hole. They've also installed coral bank protection and habitat enhancement, and they did that in partnership with the EA. It was just perfect. With the EA being a um, a key stakeholder in navigations, particularly having that sort of close working relationship with them really does help push your planning and um, uh, opportunities forward. Yeah, another nice example from the Montgomery um, was they created the new nature reserves to mitigate the effects of the restoration on the triple SI, um, which was incorporated into the canal. Yeah, that's right. So we, we know that Montgomery was very fortunate to have um, a really high value ecological area. And again, what the work done is um, again one of these sort of flagship projects for restoration that, that can indicate how we can achieve uh, navigation alongside of protecting the, uh, the environment. And, uh, yeah. yeah, I think that's all the examples that have come through, so I'll hand back to Alex. Oh, brilliant. Thank you, Jen. So before we come to um, come to the end, I just want to tell you about what the Inland Waterway Association is doing about biodiversity net gain. So we are keeping up to date with the parliamentary reviews and consultations, and 
only just found out yesterday they're looking to be um to rebegin the um the, the committee levels uh stage stage reviews uh within parliament on the 6th of november so what we'll be doing is we'll be working together with other partners across restoration to just try and ensure that um where restorations can get a good good deal out of biodiversity net gain um so alongside this we're responding to the proposed legislations through the environment bill we have responded to government and we have put forward suggestions to try and uh, trying to achieve some discounts for volunteer groups and restorations to undertake biodiversity net gain projects uh, especially the ones that can actually demonstrate a um, an increase and improvement to, to, to the ecology we're also looking at ensuring that the um, works, environmental works completed prior to restoration can be included within the biodiversity net gain application. So this is where um, the biodiversity credits would be coming in. And if you do some environmental harm work prior to the application of BNG, we can actually have that left as a um, as a store for for for, for, for uh, restoration groups. And also looking at trying to um, get into assurances from um, local councils uh, and government to incorporate canals, navigable waterways and restorations into a na the, uh, nature recovery networks at local and national level, uh, as well as we'd be able to receive biodiversity credits from local developers to uh, enhance our canals, as well as providing regular updates and opportunities for training for restoration groups and having strategic discussions at high level with within the hub, restoration hubs high level panel. Uh, so to summarize, uh, BNG will be phased into local planning over the next few years and there'll be a, um, a transition period once, once incorporated. So it won't be um, overly strict to begin with as they work out what works and what doesn't work. Um, we should be looking at incorporating biodiversity net gain as early as possible and looking at the long-term management plans for sites and preparing them in advance of any works going forward. Uh, looking to achieve those win-win scenarios for biodiversity and canal restorations as actually is quite a, uh, I say quite easy. It's, in a lot of cases, it's very, very achievable. Uh, as well as looking at BNG to be an opportunity to increase the reach of canal restorations amongst key stakeholders, potential new members, uh, and and within uh, local and regional uh, governments. So my key takeaway point here is that canal restoration is in a very unique position to really gain from biodiversity net gain, and to finally fully evidence that canal restorations are a um, are a good thing to enhance the natural environment, increasing connectivity and hand, increasing the opportunity for habitats to thrive and the ecology to, um, to succeed. Uh, so thank you for listening. I'm happy to take any uh, questions and answers assuming we have time. Yeah, thank you very much, Alex, for a really informative um, webinar. So we've got about five, ten minutes to go through some of the questions that have come through throughout your presentation. So the first one's from Helen. It was. <coughs> Could you give some examples of how opinions have changed over the last 40 years to what makes a viable habitat? Yes, yeah, so a, a, a viable habitat, yes. Yeah. So if we look back to the um, even to the 1950s or pre, the pre-war era, era where um, we had a lot more meadows and a lot more natural habitats and um, as a result of World War II, the agricultural system had increased twofold to, um, to fund the, uh, I guess, the war machine. So those born it's sort of within the 1950s with those pockets of habitats that haven't been quite developed on would have been having access to woodlands um, ponds meadows and every generation as development has occurred and we've lost these valuable habitats what they grew up with and what they see as natural is significantly changing and even speaking to um my sister who was only, was only born 10 years after me actually her opinion of what's natural is completely different to mine she goes to a park and thinks some um, low-cut grass and very maintained um very maintained habitats are natural well to me it's all very much the, the more wild the more grown is the better to me really thanks alex um we've got a question here from dave uh, are you aware of the potential opportunities that defra's environmental land management scheme offers particularly tier uh, two and level three I must have not had a proper look at it, um, so I'd be happy to have a look at it if you've got any um, information on that. I'm happy to come back to that one. Yeah, well, what we'll do is we can circulate information after the webinar on that question. Thanks, Dave. Um, this is another one from Amy Louise. In terms of building relationships with developers and landowners, is there a metric for pounds to biodiversity net gains? Um, oh, yes, there is a metric, and actually, what's, it's often held internally within an organisation. Um, 
I'll have to do a bit of research and talk to some couple of other people I know to see what we can um, find from them. But, um, and I believe Bound for Beauty have a system like that, and there will be a rough cost of how much hectares it would cost to replace certain habitats. So there is stuff out there, I just don't know whether, how accessible it is. Um, this one from Chris. Um, would simply replacing a mown grass in an urban area with a canal, i.e. aquatic environment, be classed as biodiversity net gains? Uh, yes, so if we've got a, a species poor habitat or a value or a habitat with a very limited, limited value, well, it won't be a like for like, you won't be replacing a grassland with a grassland. Um, in the biodiversity metric, um, canals are always rated with a medium distinctiveness, which has a value of four. If we're looking at amenity in arable areas, they've been given a value of two. So by replacing that amount of grassland with a canal, you actually do achieve a biodiversity net gain. Uh, as long as you think about enhancing the um, bank side and the towpath side as well. Thanks very much. So another question from Ian this time is, would you expect planning authorities to audit the success of biodiversity net gains after some years? And if so, who would pay for that? Yeah, so local authorities will be um, instrumental in recording and evaluating um, how and whether biodiversity <coughs> gains have been achieved. And I believe they'll be looking at actually increasing roles within the organisations and, and within local governments to actually incorporate ecologists who will go through applications and be providing um, measurements to um, record whether your project is on track or whether it's going to be succeeding. Um, this isn't being thought out particularly well just yet. And there is currently in the planning department of, or planning stages of who's going to be paying for that and how it's going to be incorporated. So it's one to watch out for and we'll keep you um, updated on, on, on the uh, developments. Cool, thank you. Yeah, the next question is from Helen is, how do the needs of humans, businesses and housing and development, et cetera, um, weighed against the biodiversity needs? Like how do you quantify one against the other? So it's actually now looking to change how we operate and how it's, how it's done and how, how, how developments are produced. So it's again trying to achieve that win-win scenario. Um, it, basically shifting people away from high value habitats, which have previously been um, under protected and trying to encourage developments in areas which are potentially biodiverse poor or can handle the, the strain of developments. Um, but they're also looking at actually incorporating features within um, those uh, developments and communities. So instead of building uh, just a housing complex um, tightly compacted, they'll be looking at trying to ensure that you put enhancements throughout the project. So incorporating um, native hedgerows, ponds, ditches, um, woodland planting schemes within the developments. So it's not really trying to play off the two sides against each other, but trying to work out ways that we can achieve the, the triple win scenario for eco um, economics, environment and, and society. Okay, thanks Alex. Um, this one, uh, so obviously HS2 has popped up. So I think the real question is like, how is HS2 offsetting um, the slightly destructive nature of their um, kind of development. Yeah, so HS2 is a very uh, interesting point within biodiversity net gain. Um, they are in theory looking at incorporating biodiversity net gain across their um, across the infrastructure projects, but um, currently one of the biggest big outputs from government within the environment bill is adding in an exemption from for major infrastructure projects such as large roads and HS2 to be exempt from producing biodiversity net gains, uh, which again has been a bit of a massive uproar within the um, eco ecologist community. Um, so essentially it's going to be, I mean, it would be great to see how they um, approach biodiversity net gain, but I'm not quite uh, sure how it's going to look based on how many um, ancient woodlands they're going to be passing through in reed bed habitats um, in different areas. Yeah, it's a difficult one. Um, we've just had a few questions about the biodiversity metric, kind of the software. Um, so one person has downloaded the biodiversity metric uh, version two, but it seems unusable. Is there a different version or are you able to send out a link uh, after the webinar? Yes, yeah, so I'll be able to send out a link after the webinar. It does require to have, I believe, the most up-to-date Excel um, spreadsheet. Uh, I think the last version was released up in 2019 at the end of the year. So I'm happy to talk people through this uh, later date, potentially how it's going to operate and how it works. So that's potentially another training opportunity. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to send out um, the link that I have, which works. Excellent. I think we've got time for one more question. Um, so this one 
is how we measure um, or who will measure if improvements have been achieved and if there's any issues and disputes how is that going to be dealt with so um, again, it hasn't been just confirmed who's going to be measuring it, whether it's going to be the, um, the client or the planning authority, that's still up for discussion. Um, but e either way, it's going to be a qualified ecologist who is going to be independent from both organisations should be the one to clarify the um, biodiversity net gain um, opportunities. So um, going forward, having a it potentially be looking at having a ecologist come forward to produce a biodiversity net gain plan and identifying areas where enhancements can be achieved and they'll be reviewing it throughout the process. And again, at the end, just calculating using the metric and set other systems that will be available to decide whether the um, project has been uh, achieving biodiversity net gain. And if there's conflicts, it will be again very much be going up to a, an independent panel to decide, but uh, at the end of the day, it'll probably be the um, planning authority who decides that if you've done enough or, or not done enough. Right, I've got time for one last question. This one's from John. Uh, does the Environment Bill cover Wales? I believe it does. I don't think it covers Scotland. I believe the, well, I've got to take a proper look into it, but I think it does cover part, um, cover Wales in some form or another. Okay, we can, we can, check, we can check up yes. and uh, let John know. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Alex, for answering all those questions. I think that's um, about time uh, now for the to wrap up the webinar. Um, I think we've answered all the questions, but if you do have any further questions, please do not hesitate to contact Alex and um, he'll be able to follow them up after the webinar. Uh, we'd really love some feedback on this webinar from you all. So once the room closes, you'll see a pop-up box and a survey form will appear straight away. If you could complete that, um, that'd be fantastic. So um, just well, thank you very much for joining us today and participating in the webinar. Um, and we'd like to thank Alex for taking his time to deliver this really informative uh, webinar on biodiversity net gains. And also thanks to Katie in the background for making sure everything's been running smoothly on the technical side. Um, and don't forget to join us for the webinar next uh, Thursday. This one's focused on creating connections with your wider community, with a particular focus on engaging young people. Um, and the session will be run by Canal River Trust, James Long and Carrie House. Uh, so thank you once again, and we hope to see you next week.